Chapter 20 Resurrection and Reincarnation Beings who love each other can become immortal like gods. Joyful is the one who can eat the delicious fruits of the tree of life. Know, beloved ones, that there are two exquisite trees in Eden that even share the same roots. One is the tree of knowledge, the other is the tree of life. The first gives you wisdom, the second makes you immortal. Everyone who has worked in the great work has the right to eat of the delicious fruits of the tree of life. Indeed, love is the summum of wisdom. Those men and women who traverse the path of perfect matrimony finally gain the joy of entering nirvana. It is the oblivion of the world and men forever. It is impossible to describe the joy of nirvana. There, every tear has disappeared forever. There, the soul, divested of the four bodies of sin, submerges itself within the infinite joy of the music of the spheres. Nirvana is a sacred star-filled space. The masters of compassion, moved by human pain, renounce the great joy of nirvana and resolve to stay with us in this valley of great bitterness. Every perfect matrimony inevitably reaches adepthood. Every adept can renounce nirvana for the love of the great orphan. When the adept renounces the supreme bliss of nirvana, he can then ask for the elixir of long life. The blessed ones who receive this marvelous elixir die, but do not die. On the third day they rise. This has already been demonstrated by the adorable one. On the third day, the adept comes before the sepulchre, accompanied by holy women, who bring medicine and aromatic unguents. The angels of death and other ineffable hierarchies also accompany the adept. The adept calls out in a great voice, invoking his physical body, which sleeps within the holy sepulchre. The body is raised and can escape from the sepulchre by taking advantage of the existence of hyperspace. In the superior worlds, the physical body is treated by the holy women with medicines and aromatic unguents. After the body has returned to life, obeying supreme orders, it penetrates through the sidereal head of the soul master. Thus, this is how the master regains possession of his glorified body. This is the precious gift of Cupid. Every resurrected body normally lives within the superior worlds. Nevertheless, we must clarify that. Resurrected masters can make themselves instantaneously visible and tangible in any place, and then disappear. Count Cagliostro comes to mind. This great master fulfilled a remarkable political mission in Europe and astounded the whole of humanity. This great master was really the one who provoked the fall of the kings of Europe. In fact, we owe the Republic to him. He lived during the time of Jesus Christ, was a personal friend to Cleopatra, and worked for Catherine de' Medici. He was known during various centuries in Europe. He used various names such as Giuseppe Balsamo, Count Cagliostro, etc. The immortal Babaji, the Yogi Christ of India, still lives in India. This master was the instructor of the great masters who lived through the terrifying night of time. Nevertheless, this sublime elder looks like a young 25-year-old man. Let's remember Count Sinoni, a youth despite his thousands of years. Unfortunately, this Chaldean sage failed completely because he fell in love with an actress from Naples. He committed the mistake of uniting with her and spilling the cup of Hermes. The result was horrible. Zanoni died on the guillotine during the French Revolution. Resurrected masters travel from one place to another utilizing hyperspace. This can be demonstrated with hypergeometry. Astrophysics will soon discover the existence of hyperspace. Sometimes, after fulfilling a particular mission in a country, resurrected masters allow themselves the luxury of passing for dead. On the third day, they repeat their resurrection and leave for another country in order to work under a different name. So, in this way, two years after his death, Cagliostro appeared in other cities using a different name in order to continue his work. The perfect matrimony converts us into gods. Great is the joy of love. In fact, only love confers immortality upon us. Blessed be love, blessed be the beings who adore each other. Resurrection and Reincarnation Many students of occultism confuse resurrection with reincarnation. The Gospels have always been very poorly interpreted by occultist students. There are various types of resurrection, just as there are various types of reincarnation. This is what we are going to clarify in this chapter. Every true adept has a body of paradise. This body is of flesh and bone. However, it is flesh that does not come from Adam. The body of paradise is formed with the best atoms of the physical organism. Many adepts resurrect within the superior worlds after death with this body of paradise. 
resurrected masters can visit the physical world with this body of paradise and make themselves visible and tangible at will. This is a type of ineffable resurrection. However, we affirm that resurrection with the mortal body of Adam, though more painful due to the return into this valley of bitterness, is therefore more glorious. All adepts of the secret path who form the guardian wall have resurrected with the body of Adam. There are also initiatic resurrections. The third initiation of fire signifies resurrection in the astral world. Everyone who passes through the third initiation of fire has to live the drama of Christ, life, passion, death, and resurrection within the astral world. Reincarnation of the Personality The personality is time. The personality lives in its own time and does not reincarnate. After death, the personality also goes to the grave. For the personality, there is no tomorrow. The personality lives in the cemetery, it wanders about the cemetery or submerges into its grave. It is neither the astral body nor the etheric double. It is not the soul. It is time. It is energetic, and it disintegrates very slowly. The personality can never reincarnate. It does not ever reincarnate. There is no tomorrow for the human personality. The ego, that which continues, that which reincarnates, is not the soul either because the human being still does not have soul. In fact, it is the ego that reincarnates, the I, the reincarnating principle, the ghost of the defunct, the recollections, the memory, the error, which is perpetuated. Lifespan. The unit of life of any living creature is equivalent to one beat of its heart. Every living thing has a defined period of time. The life of a planet is 2 billion 700 million beats. That same quantity corresponds to the ant, the worm, the eagle, the microbe, to man, and in general to all creatures. The lifespan of each world and each creature is proportionally the same. Clearly, the beat of a world occurs every 27,000 years but the heart of an insect beats more rapidly. An insect that lives for only one summer evening has had in its heart the same number of beats as a planet except those beats have been more rapid. Time is not a straight line, as the erudite ignoramuses believe. Time is a closed curve. Eternity is another thing. Eternity has nothing to do with time, and what is beyond eternity, and time is known only by the great illuminated adepts, the masters of humanity. There are three known dimensions and three unknown dimensions, a total of six fundamental dimensions. The three known dimensions are length, width, and depth. The three unknown dimensions are time, eternity, and what is beyond time and eternity. This is the spiral of six curves. Time belongs to the fourth dimension, eternity to the fifth dimension, that which is beyond eternity, and time to the sixth dimension. The personality lives in a closed curve of time. She is the daughter of her time and ends with her time. Time cannot reincarnate. There is no tomorrow for the human personality. The circle of time revolves within the circle of eternity. In eternity there is no time but time revolves within the circle of eternity. The serpent always bites its own tail. Time and personality end but with the turning of the wheel a new time and personality appear upon the earth. The ego reincarnates and everything is repeated. The last realizations, sentiments, preoccupations, affections, and words cause all the sexual sensations and all the amorous drama that give rise to a new physical body. All the romances of spouses and lovers are related to the last moments of those dying. The path of life is formed by the hoof prints of the horse of death. With death, time closes and eternity opens. The circle of eternity first opens and then closes when the ego returns to the circle of time. Recurrence the initiates of the fourth way define recurrence as the repetition of acts, scenes, and events. Everything is repeated. The law of recurrence is a tremendous reality. In each incarnation the same events are repeated. The repetition of acts is accompanied by its corresponding karma. This is the law that reconciles effects to the causes which gave rise to them. Every repetition of acts carries karma and sometimes dharma, reward. Those who work with the great arcanum, those who tread the straight, narrow, and difficult path of perfect matrimony are gradually liberated from the law of recurrence. This law has a limit. Beyond that limit we become angels or devils. With white sexual magic we become angels. With black sexual magic we become devils. The question of personality. The subject of personality, which is the child of its time and which dies in its time, deserves our attention. Indeed, it is completely clear that if the personality were to reincarnate, time would reincarnate 
and this is absurd because time is a closed curve. A Roman man reincarnated in these modern times of the 20th century, with the personality of the time of the Caesars, would in fact be intolerable. We would have to treat him as a delinquent because his customs would in no way correspond to those we have today. The Returns of the Ego The symbol of Jesus expelling the merchants from the temple with whip in hand pertains to a tremendous reality of death and horror. We have already said that the eye is pluralized. The I, the ego, is a legion of devils. Many readers will not like this assertion. Nonetheless, it is the truth, and we must say it even if we don't like it. During the work with the demon, during the work of the dissolution of the ego, parts of the I, subhuman entities, entities that possess part of our consciousness and our life, are eliminated, cast out of our inner temple. Sometimes these entities reincarnate in animal bodies. How many times might we have encountered discarded forms of ourselves living in animal bodies while at a zoo? There are people who are so animalistic that if everything animal was removed from them, nothing would remain. These types of people are lost cases. The law of recurrence has ended for these people. The law of reincarnation has ended for them. These types of people can reincarnate into animal bodies or enter definitively into the abyss. There they continue disintegrating slowly. Advantages of Resurrection The one who renounces nirvana out of love for humanity is able to conserve his physical body for millions of years. Without resurrection, the adept would find himself needing to change bodies constantly. This would be an evident disadvantage. With resurrection, the adept does not need to change his body. He can conserve his vehicle for millions of years. The body of a resurrected adept is totally transformed. The soul within the body transforms the body totally converting it into soul too, until the adept becomes entirely soul. A resurrected body has its fundamental seat in the internal worlds. It lives in the internal worlds, and only makes itself visible in the physical world by means of willpower. Thus, a resurrected master can instantaneously appear or disappear wherever he wishes. No one can apprehend or incarcerate him. He travels within the astral plane to wherever he wishes. The most interesting thing for the resurrected adept is the Great Leap. When the time comes, the resurrected master can take his body to another planet. The resurrected master can live with his resurrected body on another planet. This is one of the great advantages. Every resurrected adept is able to make things of the astral visible and tangible by transferring them into the physical plane. This can be explained because the master has his fundamental seat in the astral even though he can manifest himself physically. Cagliostro, the enigmatic Count Cagliostro, after his departure from the Bastille, invited his friends to a banquet. There, in the midst of the feast, he invoked many deceased spirits, who also sat at the table to the amazement of the guests. On another occasion, as if by magic, Cagliostro made a precious golden dinner service appear from which his guests ate. The powerful Count Cagliostro transmuted lead into gold, and made pure diamonds of the highest quality through the vivification of carbon. The powers of every resurrected master are a true advantage. A great friend, a resurrected adept who currently lives in the Great Tartary, told me the following, Before swallowing soil, one is nothing but a fool. One thinks one knows a lot but knows nothing. One only really comes to be good, once one has swallowed soil. Before this, one knows nothing. He also said to me, Masters fall because of sex. This reminds us of Count Zanoni. He fell when he ejaculated the semen. Zanoni was a resurrected master. He fell in love with an actress from Naples, and he fell. Zanoni died on the guillotine during the French Revolution. Whoever wants to achieve resurrection has to follow the path of perfect matrimony. There is no other path. Only with sexual magic can we attain resurrection. Only with sexual magic can we liberate ourselves from the wheel of reincarnations in a positive and transcendental manner. Loss of the Soul in the preceding chapters, we said the human being still has not incarnated his soul. Only with sexual magic can we engender the internal vehicles. These vehicles, as with plants, sleep latent within the hard darkness of the grain, the seed, which is deposited in the seminal system. When the human being has the Christic vehicles, he can incarnate his soul. Whoever does not work with the grain, whoever does not practice sexual magic, cannot germinate his Christic bodies. The one who does not have Christic bodies cannot incarnate his soul either, he loses his soul, and in the long term he is submerged within the abyss where he disintegrates slowly. 
Jesus, the great master, said, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Whoever does not incarnate his soul loses it. The one who does not have Christic vehicles does not incarnate it. Whoever does not work with the grain does not have Christic vehicles. Whoever does not practice sexual magic does not work with the grain. The resurrection of the dead is only for men with soul. In fact, only men with soul are true men in the complete sense of the word. Only true men can achieve the great resurrection. Only men with soul can endure the funeral trials of the thirteenth arcanum. These trials are more horrifying than death itself. Those who do not have a soul are mere sketches of men, phantoms of death. That is all. The vehicles of men without soul are ghostly vehicles. They are not the authentic vehicles of fire. In reality, men without soul are not true men. In fact, the human being is still a non-realized being. Very few are they who have soul. The great majority of beings who are called humans still do not have soul. Of what use is it for man to accumulate all the riches of the world if he loses his soul? The resurrection of the dead is only for men with soul. Real immortality is only for men with soul. Love and Death To many readers, it may seem strange that we relate love with death and resurrection. In Hindu mythology, love and death are two faces of one deity. Shiva, the god of the universal sexual creative force, is at the same time the god of violent death and destruction. Shiva's wife also has two faces. She is Parvati and Kali at the same time. As Parvati, she is supreme beauty, love, and happiness. As Kali or Durga, she can transform herself into death, disgrace, and bitterness. Shiva and Kali together symbolize the tree of knowledge, the tree of the science of good and evil. Love and death are twin brothers who never separate. The path of life is formed by the hoof prints of the horse of death. The error of many cults and schools lies in their being unilateral. They study death but do not want to study love when, in fact, they are two faces of one deity. The diverse doctrines of the East and the West really believe they know love when, in fact, they do not. Love is a cosmic phenomenon in which the history of the earth and its races are simple accidents. Love is the mysterious magnetic and occult force the alchemist needs in order to fabricate the philosopher's stone and the elixir of long life, without which resurrection is impossible. Love is a force that I can never subordinate because Satan can never subjugate God. The learned ignoramuses are mistaken about the origin of love. The foolish are mistaken about its effect. It is stupid to suppose the only objective of love is reproduction of the species. Truly, Love unfolds and develops in a very different plane, which the swine of materialism radically ignore. Only an infinitesimal force of love is used to perpetuate the species. What happens to the rest of the force? Where does it go? Where does it develop? This is what the learned ignoramuses ignore. Love is energy, and cannot be lost. The surplus of energy has other uses and purposes which people ignore. The surplus of the energy of love is intimately related with thought feeling, and will. Without sexual energy these faculties could not develop. The creative energy is transformed into beauty, thought, feeling, harmony, poetry, art, wisdom, etc. The supreme transformation of creative energy produces, as a result, the awakening of consciousness and the death and resurrection of the initiate. Indeed, all creative activity of humanity comes from the marvelous force of love. Love is the marvelous force that awakens man's mystical powers. Without love, resurrection of the dead is impossible. It is urgent to again open the temples of love in order to celebrate the mystical festivals of love anew. Only with the enchantments of love does the serpent of fire awaken. If we want the resurrection of the dead, we first need to be devoured by the serpent. The one who has not been devoured by the serpent is worthless. If we want the verb to become flesh in us, we need to practice sexual magic intensely. The verb is in sex. The lingam yoni is the foundation of all power. We first need to raise the serpent on the staff, and then be devoured by the serpent. In this way we become serpents. In India, adepts are called nagas, serpents. In Teotihuacan, Mexico, there is a marvelous temple of serpents. Only the serpents of fire can resurrect from among the dead. An inhabitant of the two-dimensional world, with his two-dimensional psychology, would think that all phenomena that occur in his plane would have their cause and effect their birth and death, there. Such phenomena would be identical to those beings. 
those two-dimensional beings would take all phenomena that came from the third dimension as exceptional findings in their two-dimensional world. They wouldn't accept being told about a third dimension because for them only their flat two-dimensional world would exist. Yet, if these flat beings resolved to abandon their two-dimensional psychology to deeply comprehend the causes of all the phenomena of their world, they would then be able to come out of it and discover in amazement a great unknown world, the three-dimensional world. The same would happen with the matter of love. People think that love is only to perpetuate the species. People think love is only vulgarity, carnal pleasure, violent desire, satisfaction, etc. Only those who are able to see beyond these animal passions, only the one who renounces this type of animal psychology can discover, in other worlds and dimensions, the grandiosity and majesty of that which is called love. People dream profoundly. People live asleep and dream of love but they haven't awoken to love. They sing of love and believe love is that which they dream about. When man wakes up to love, he becomes conscious of love, he recognizes he was dreaming. Then and only then is the true meaning of love discovered. Only then does one discover what he was dreaming about. Only then does one come to know that which is called love. This awakening is similar to that of the man who, being in the astral body outside of his physical body, realizes he has awakened the consciousness. People in the astral walk around dreaming. When someone realizes he is dreaming, he says, This is a dream. I am dreaming. I am in the astral body. I am outside of my physical body. The dream disappears as if by enchantment, and the individual remains awake in the astral world. A new and marvelous world appears before the one who was dreaming before. His consciousness has awoken. Now he can know all the marvels of nature. Awakening to love is like this, too. Before that awakening, we dream about love, we live in a world of passions, sometimes delicious romances, heartbreaks, vain oaths, carnal desires, jealousy, etc., etc., and we believe it is love. We are dreaming, and we don't know it. Resurrection of the dead is impossible without love because love and death are two faces of the same deity. It is necessary to awaken to love to attain resurrection. It is urgent to renounce our three-dimensional psychology and crude facts to discover the meaning of love in the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh dimensions. Love comes from the superior dimensions. Whoever does not renounce his three-dimensional psychology will never discover the true meaning of love because love does not originate in the three-dimensional world. If the flat being does not renounce his two-dimensional psychology, he will believe the only reality of the universe is lines, lines changing colors in a plane, etc. A flat being wouldn't know that the lines, and the changing colors of certain lines, could be the result of a wheel of multicolored spokes spinning around, perhaps a carriage. The two-dimensional being wouldn't know the existence of that carriage, and with his two-dimensional psychology, he wouldn't believe in that carriage. He would only believe in the lines and the changing colors seen in his world, without knowing they were only effects of superior causes. Those who believe love is only of this three-dimensional world are just the same, and they only accept crude facts as the one true meaning of love. People like this cannot discover the true meaning of love. People like this cannot be devoured by the serpent of fire. People like this cannot resurrect from among the dead. All poets, all lovers, have some of love but none really know what love is. People only dream about that which is called love. People have not awoken to love. 